So last week we uh, launched this new series from the book of 1 Peter to talk about how former outsiders to God, that's all of us at some point in our journey, former outsiders to God live as outsiders in the world. And the reason we called this series Outsiders is because that's what Peter says we are. We're on the outside. We're, we're on the outside looking in. In fact, if you have your Bible or your device today, I want you to open up and look to 1 Peter. And if you, you have a device, we've got free Wi-Fi, uh, guest Wi-Fi for you to use so you can open up to that text. But I want us to look together at what Peter says to people who are on the outside. And that's how he describes it. In fact, right here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, this is how Peter begins his book, he says, to God's elect strangers in the world. Strangers in the world. How many of you ever used the phrase with your kids, stranger danger? Have you ever used that, right, that terminology, stranger danger? You're the stranger. You're the one on the outside. You're the foreigner, the alien, the, the stranger. Because if you're a Christian and you live in the world, you're going to find yourself on the outside. Every Christian has throughout the history of the world as they follow Jesus. It's been that way from the beginning. You know, Peter is writing in 60 to 65 AD to those believers who he goes on in chapter 1 to say, those believers who are scattered, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and the places he's mentioning are our modern-day Turkey. So if you were to go just north of Israel, here's the Mediterranean Sea, you would come to modern-day Turkey, and it is this region of the world that Peter is writing to, to the believers there. And it's not surprising that there's believers in that part of the world, because on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, it tells us that when the gospel was preached by Peter, there were people there from Cappadocia and Asia and Pontus, they were there, and so they, they experienced that powerful preaching of the gospel, the coming of the Holy Spirit. There are Christians there, Peter's writing to them, and he says in chapter 1, verse 5, you may have suffered a little. You may have suffered a little. Why? Why? Because people, Christians, were suffering. Now, if you were to go to Rome, the suffering was pretty intense. The emperor at that time was Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. We just call him Nero. And Nero, as he took over the Roman Empire at the age of 17, went after Christians. People were being arrested, ostracized, facing the loss of job, loss of property, loss of respect. Some were tortured, some were beheaded, some were thrown to the lions, some were set on fire to light his gardens. That's what was happening to the followers of Jesus in Rome. Some of that persecution in its various forms was making its way to other parts of the world. Which is why last week, Alan Tiger, our college-age young adult minister, preached to us, this, launching this series for us. And he was referring to Charles Pope's five stages of religious persecution. That, that all throughout Christianity, we're going to face some level of persecution and and he took us through those five stages that Charles Popes talks about. Each stage builds in intensity. The very first stage of persecution was stereotyping. Stereotyping. Where a description gets used to, to describe a group of people. Then it's used again and again over and over. Such as hypocrites. Boring. Other things like that. You move from stereotyping to vilifying. And vilifying is, is one of those words that's used to strip away the dignity of the person. Things like they're closed-minded, they're intolerant, they're bigot. They're bigoted, I guess. Another word is marginalizing. Marginalizing happens when Christianity is moved to the margins of society. Um, it's not welcome here. It's not allowed here. You, we'll push to the outside. We become outsiders. Marginalizing. I was reading this week just some examples of marginalizing and how it's happening in our culture. I, I was reading about the Christian Service Center in Lake City, Florida, who for over 30 years have been distributing food to the needy and helping the poor and providing food for them and caring for them and praying for them, giving them Bibles and sharing with them. They've been doing this for over 30 years, and they were informed by the state agricultural department that they could no longer receive and distribute USDA food unless they remove the images of Jesus from their ministry center. 
And unless they stop giving Bibles to the needy, you're not going to receive food to carry on this ministry unless you get rid of those things. And they fortunately declined the food and said, no thanks. And so they didn't accept it. And they said, God will provide in other ways. And sure enough, other churches were stepping up and coming in and helping provide the food. They, they, they were marginalized. I read an example of an Eastern Michigan University graduate student who was removed from its graduate program, she was pursuing counseling because of her Christian belief. She had a Christian belief that the, the lifestyle of homosexuality was wrong according to what she read in Scripture, a moral belief that she held. And so she had some issues on the way that counseling was done in some of those situations. And the university told her that she would be allowed to remain in the program if she went through a remediation program so that she could see the error in her ways and rethink her belief system. In other words, your beliefs and your convictions, they're, they're not allowed here. They're, they're pushed here. And in fact, you can't go through our program if this is your true belief system and how you're going to act or behave. And so it is marginalized. Convictions, beliefs, based on God's word, marginalized. That's a part of persecution that's obviously happening even in our own country. There's a fourth uh, step, and that is criminalizing. Criminalizing happens when legislation or lawsuits are directed at believers or at Christians because of their moral convictions, their religious held beliefs. We've already been seeing that happen right here in the United States of America. Every one of these is already happening right now. And we have multiple examples of that. But we get to step number five. And step number five goes beyond criminalizing, persecuting, which relates to heavy fines, loss of job, loss of property, incarceration. And of course, in some places of the world right now, persecuting gets quite physical and violent, bodily harm that is done. And I really do believe that while all of these things we're, we're already sensing to some degree, this is where we're headed in the United States of America. We are, we are on a track to get to persecuting, and it is what has happened in, in places all over the world. It's, it's not something that should be a surprise to Christians because we are on the outside. Every month in our world, an average of 322 Christians are killed for their faith. There are some 214 churches or Christian ministries that are destroyed. An average of 722. Now, let me mention, these are the ones that are documented, right? This is the documented. So in other words, way more than this. But 722 documented acts of violence, beatings, abductions, rape, arrests that are committed against Christians because of their faith. Those are all statistics that are documented because of their faith. And so as Peter is writing to these believers that are scattered and, and his words are ring true for us today, he's giving us a directive of, of how we ought to look, what we ought to look like how to look like Jesus while responding to opposition and responding to persecution. And if we respond the way that Peter directs us to respond according to this text, it's actually an opportunity for the gospel to do great things. Because I think we've learned throughout history that when Christians are in a position of power, we don't look so much like Jesus. But when we begin to experience opposition, we have an opportunity to shine as people show the grace and the truth of Jesus and they stay true to their convictions and they face that opposition. Jesus is seen in their lives. And so last week, what Alan talked to us about was the hope that we have, that we have a living hope. Even though we face suffering, we have a living hope, a hope that says there's a home and this is not it, and that we can have joy beyond our circumstances. But today what I want to focus on is holiness. So last week was hope, this week is holiness. In other words, your perspective on persecution should include hope, but your behavior during persecution should include holiness, holy behavior. So let's look at this together right here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. And here's what Peter says. He says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And so what Peter says to us in this text is that you are outsiders not just because the world is marginalizing you. 
You are outsiders because God is calling you. He's calling you to this. He's called you to be holy, to be distinct, to be set apart. He's called you to that, to be different. I don't mean socially awkward different. What I mean is that your life as a Christian should look very different than the life of a non-Christian. Your life as a Christian should look very different than your life before you were a Christian. A holy life is distinctly different. And God is calling you to this. He's calling out to you. Now, I think it's interesting that whenever you watch the NFL draft, right? The NFL draft happens, uh, it's coming up, right? It hasn't happened yet, did it? I haven't been paying too much close attention. Did it happen? Thursday? Thursday. Thank you. 2016 draft is coming up Thursday. NFL draft, right? This is a big deal. Very few, very few football players are ever going to make it into the NFL. I mean, that is, it's just rarer. It is rare. And so you have, you have these guys, these grown men, these beasts, these specimens, these, these linemen, these linebackers, these guys, and, and they're, they're sitting there just waiting for this call, waiting for a team to, to bring them on. And when the call comes and you see their reaction, these grown men just, <laughs> just crying. It's everything that they've been you know, working for and, and hoping for. That they've, they've gotten this call to come. Their dream is fulfilled. It's a big deal. In Scripture, time and time again, we read that we have been called by God. God has called you. And when Jesus wanted to to call men to follow him, to become his disciples, he said, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And Peter was one of those fishers of men who responded to the call and said, "I'm, I'm following him. I'm going after him. And as followers of Jesus, they were distinctly different. In fact, Peter himself in Acts 4.13, it said that when the religious leaders were looking at Peter and John, and they saw Peter, and they, they noticed that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, astonished at what was going on in their life and what they were hearing. And they took note, these men have been with Jesus. Man, when you're a follower of Jesus, you are called to be distinct, to be different. People will be astonished when they look at your life and your responses to situations. And so all throughout the book, Peter says, man, remember what, you, what God called you to do. 1 Peter 2.9, we were called out of darkness into light. 1 Peter 2.21, you're called to suffer and follow Christ's example in meekness. 1 Peter 3.9, you're called to inherit a blessing, a blessing from God. In chapter 5, verse 10, you are called to his eternal glory. And so I just want you to notice, we are the ones called, but notice what we're called to Peter says, you're called to holiness. Now here's what I've noticed through the years. Watching, observing followers of Jesus in our culture. Is that oftentimes we're not responding to this call to holiness. And in fact... Uh, here's some signs we're not responding to God's call for holiness. We spend more time, we spend more time calling the culture out than calling Christians out. If I were to stand up here right now and say, you know what's happening in our culture? Our culture is this and our culture is that. And you'd be like, amen, right, God, that's what's going on in our culture. But I said, you know what's happening in you? And I start calling you out? You're like, hey, hold on. Wait a minute. Getting too personal there. We like to call the culture out because that's easy. But I think as you read 1 Peter, you're going to notice Peter is not expecting non-Christians to act like Christians. He's expecting Christians to act like Christians. And today sometimes we have Christians who think they just want to live life like they're on jury duty, which sounds like a miserable existence. But they... Spend their time trying to point out all the ways that their, their co-workers and their neighbors and even strangers are wrong and they want to convict them for doing wrong. They want to call them out. But I think the emphasis we see throughout the book of First Peter is God's calling, all out, calling us out. Revival is not going to happen because a bunch of non-Christians start acting like Christians. It's going to happen when Christians start acting like Christians. That's when revival happens. So we're not calling the culture out. We're calling ourselves out. And then number two, I think another sign that we're not responding to God's call is we try to divide our lives into the sacred and the secular. 
the sacred and the secular. And we have parts of our lives that are sacred, and the other parts of our lives that's, it's secular, doesn't really have anything to do with my faith. We try to segment it. But I'm telling you right now, if holiness, holiness is not holy if it doesn't permeate everything. Holiness must permeate everything. To be holy means to give glory to God in everything I do. In, in Corinthians, Paul says, you can even eat and drink to the glory of God. You can do this for God's glory. And so if something cannot be done for the glory of God, it must be out of the will of God. I think a third way that we don't respond to God's call for holiness is we lack a reverent fear of God. We lack a reverent fear of God. Peter tells us in this text that we are to have a reverent fear of God because God judges impartially. So you should live here as a stranger, as an outsider, in reverent fear of him. It's the reverent fear of God that will lead you to live in such a way. To fear God means to be in awe of God. I'm not sure we live with a reverent fear of God. I, mean, I hear him referred to as the man upstairs. Seems to be lacking some reverence. One baseball called him the great one baseball player called him the great Yankee in the sky. We have t-shirts made. I've seen them. Jesus is my homeboy. Or we flippantly say, oh my, and we take his name in vain. When, who Peter is writing to, when he talks about reverent fear, I'm telling you, these people, there was a fear of, of God, a reverent fear of God in the sense that, that they wouldn't even speak his name. They wouldn't write his name. They live with this this fear of who God is, in awe of him, a reverence of who he was. And when you realize that this God is the almighty, powerful God who knows all and sees all and is the ultimate judge, you will watch what you say and you will watch what you do. It will impact how you live. It will influence your behavior when you live in reverent fear of him. I mean, it influences our behavior right now when we live in reverent fear of somebody. Just out of curiosity, how many of you right now, fairly often, you will drive this stretch of road? You will drive I-44 between Kansas Expressway and Glenstone. Go ahead and raise your hand if you will do that fairly often. Raise them up. I want to see everybody in the room, okay? Because this will matter here in a minute. So quite a few of you, pretty often you drive I-44 between Kansas Expressway and Glenstone. How many of you are acutely aware that when you get off Kansas Expressway onto I-44, and you are making your way towards Glenstone, how many of you are acutely aware that as you come over that hill on I-44, there is a perfect spot right there in the median for the highway patrol to be facing your direction? How many of you, are, just raise your hand if you're very aware of this. Now raise your hand if you have suffered the consequences of such. No, you don't have to do that. But yeah, uh, probably, probably some of you have. You're very aware of this, aren't you? You know he's there. Because he sees all. He knows all. And how many of you, if you're totally honest, those of you raise your hand. How many of you, as you have started to crest that hill before, and you're right, maybe you're running a few minutes behind to work, the thought enters your mind, what might be sitting in that median. And therefore, you back off a little bit with your speed, as you're going, because you know, go ahead and raise your hand if that's been you on occasion. Get them up. Get them loud and proud. Just be proud. Yep. Yeah, me too. It's happened. Because you have a reverent fear of what that might mean. So highway patrolmen in the audience, and we do have some in the church, uh, it works. It does work. We're saying it, it affects our, our behavior. Peter's saying the same thing with, with our God. When you have a reverent fear of God, it influences your behavior so you bring glory to God. And so there's some things here that Peter says you've got to get rid of. There's some things you've got to stop doing. You need to let off the accelerator on these things and put the brake on to these things. 1 Peter 2, 1, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, that's wickedness, and all deceit. Have you ever been deceitful? Have you ever hit delete? Have you ever hid something? Envy. Envious. I want what they have, and I don't want them to have it. Slander. The way you've spoken about someone else. 
of every kind. There's all kinds of slander of every kind and deceit and envy and malice of every kind. Hey, if, these are the things you are to get rid of. There's some things that God wants you to remove from your life. And that's not an exhaustive list by any means. But Peter says, get rid of these, and here's why. Because later in verse 12, he will say, live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Your holy living brings glory to God. And what I want to do right now is just give you two, two ways that you in your living can bring glory to God. How outsiders bring glory to God. Number one is this. Know who you are. Know who you are. Sometimes it's helpful to be reminded who you are. And here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He says several things here. He says, first of all, he says, God chose you. You are a chosen people. He chose you. Man, it feels good when somebody chooses you, doesn't it? That's why those NFL players are just waiting for that call, for that team to choose them. And when it comes, it feels wonderful. They're elated because I got chosen. It's so special. You know, that same thing happens when someone is adopted. When someone's adopted into a family, Angela Highfield, we prayed for her just a, you know, a couple months ago. She's gone to Thailand. She's working in a ministry there. She'll be gone for a little over a year. And I was reading her blog as she talks about her journey over there. And here's what she wrote in her blog as she talks about loving on these children. And, uh, and she writes in her blog, because she, she's already seen some adoptions take place. And here's one thing she wrote. She said, the second adoption happened just this week. The parents have been waiting 14 years to have children. And after many prayers and many tears, they got to meet their beautiful daughter. With each adoption I get to witness, my heart soars. It is amazing to watch families become whole and children get a forever home. In the moments when people become parents, I glimpse, I glimpse love at its purest form. The willingness to go to the ends of the world for a precious child and give them new life is love at its core. It's a visual representation of God's deep love for us. Man, she's right. That's, his, that's our adoption story. God chose you. He adopted you into his family. You are chosen. And then Peter said this also. He said, you're a royal priesthood. You. You're a royal priesthood. In the Old Testament... The people had a priesthood. In the New Testament, the people are the priesthood. Peter will say in verse 5, you are living stones being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to God. Now, what's the spiritual sacrifices? What are the sacrifices we make? Because they're spiritual sacrifices. It's not a goat. It's not a lamb. It's not a sheep. It's not a, not a dove like the Old Testament. It's a spiritual sacrifice. So what kind of sacrifice is that? Well, he tells us what it is in verse 9. First of all, it is good words. It's your testimony. He says that we might declare the praises of him who called us. It is good words. It's your testimony about God. And then secondly, it's good works. It's what you do. Living a life of holiness before the world. We are a holy priesthood. That means our holy living is not just to please God. That's reverent fear. But it's also to attract others to him, to attract the world to him. He goes on, he says, you are a holy nation. Now that's not who you are by ethnicity, it's not who you, who you are by birth, this is who you are by faith. This is the church, a holy nation. This is the new Israel. You've been made holy, declared holy, and you're being made holy by the power of God. You are a holy nation. Then he goes on and says this, you are God's special possession. God's special possession. He is holding on to you. Sometimes I'll see little kids come into church on a Sunday morning and they're bringing with them, you know, little whatever, a little rabbit, little whatever they got. And they're, they're coming into church. That's their special possession. They just can't leave home without it. God, God's saying that you are a people, a special possession. You're a people that belong to God, a people belonging to God. 
So if you know who you are, a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, you're going to live according to who you are. That's pretty special. It's pretty awesome. But I'm going to tell you a danger about this. And this is something I've observed and I've seen. It's something you have observed, you have seen as well. Here's the danger. Oftentimes, it can easily happen that the chosen people, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people belonging to God, in their pursuit of holiness, can become prideful. They can become arrogant. People can think they're growing in holiness when in fact they're growing in religious arrogance. And they'll think, I don't associate with you. I, I'm better than you. I'm more spiritual than you. I'm above you. I'm holier than you. That is oftentimes how the world describes us in the church, meaning we've given them such a cause to think it. That is the pharisaical approach of the religious leaders during the time of Jesus. Their spiritual pursuits puff them up with arrogance. Holiness should never lead to arrogance. True holiness is not prideful. Holiness should never lead us to isolate ourselves from the world. The world needs our influence. The world needs our witness. Insulation, yes. Isolation, no. Contact, yes. Contamination, no. And that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 12, live such good lives among the pagans. Live among. Live among. Because if you live among, you can make a difference. You won't make a difference with religious arrogance. And so there must be another trait that accompanies your holiness. Otherwise, you're going to do great damage to the kingdom. And the trait is not arrogance. The trait is humility. Humility. That is why Peter not only tells you, know who you are, but he goes on in the text in verse 10 to say, remember who you were. Remember who you were. There's no way you can be arrogant if you remember who you were. Have you ever looked at pictures with your family, looked at pictures going way back years and years ago? I mean, look at those pictures of yourself. Maybe your kids are with you or friends are with you, and they all just start laughing. Doesn't that happen? They look at old pictures of you, and they just start laughing out loud. My kids do. There's a picture that hangs in my bedroom. It's of my wife and I on our wedding day. She likes that picture, so it's continued to be there for 20, going on two years. And my kids, they, when they come into the bedroom, still randomly, they'll, they'll start laughing, they'll look, Dad, look at you, because like, I have big glasses. They're like, you're such a, you're so, such a dork. You're so weird. You're such... And they'll just laugh and point at it, say I look funny. And I did, big old bug-eyed glasses on there, just, you know. <laughs> it's amazing how awesome I am now, you know, in light of all of that, <laughs> how great I've turned out. <laughs> We were looking at pictures just yesterday with, with my in-laws, my father-in-law. And I, it, was, it was DVDs back when he was in high school, college. And, and we were looking at these pictures. And I got to, I was looking at him. I'm like, he actually looked really cool because everything he's wearing in that video is kind of like back in style now. It's coming back in. You know, a little bit tighter shorts, just the shirts he was wearing. I'm like, Marion, I mean, you look cool in the video. You know, was, it's taken this long for that to happen, but it's happening again. Remembering who you were allows us to be humble. And 1 Peter 2.10 says this, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Remember who you were? Remember how much you've been forgiven of? Remember how undeserving you were and are of God's grace? Remember how lost you were. And so he says, Peter will go on in chapter 5, verse 5, so clothe yourselves with humility. That should be part of your daily wear. Every day, be dressed in humility. Verse 6, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. If you're puffing yourself up, you're no longer living with a reverent fear of God because when you're in reverent fear of God, you'll know how big he is and how small you are. Holiness and humility must go together. They have to. Because holy, holiness without humility is pharisaical religious arrogance. 
And how outsiders bring glory to God is they are holy and humble. They're holy and humble. All right, let me close with this. This is what I'm calling the bonus point. The bonus point. Those of you who have been in the church a long time, you just know this is point number three, and it's going to be a quick one. But anyway, bonus point. Here you go. The key to being holy and humble is to reflect on what Christ did. The key to being holy and humble is to reflect on what Christ did. Now before we reflect on what Christ did from the text, I want to ask that our servers would go ahead and be dismissed for a time of communion that is coming. I'd like for the rest of you to look up here at the text, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. Where Peter writes, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You were redeemed. That language was so strong because in that culture there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Now slavery wasn't quite like what it was here in the United States. It wasn't the same. But they could buy their way out of slavery or someone could buy, pay the way for them to come out of slavery. Both required redemption. So anytime we talk about redemption, for them that was powerful language. To be free was this great gift. And he's saying you were bought, you were redeemed, you were set free by the blood of Jesus. When you understand that it will lead you to want to be holy to live for God to put off the things of this world and live for him it'll lead you to want to be an outsider and if you understand the blood of Jesus you will also understand humility because you remember what he did for you what it took for you to come into a right relationship with God and so what I'm wanting to do today is as Peter reminds us of the redemption of Jesus I want us to reflect on this as we take communion today in just a moment, there's going to be trays of bread that will come down your row and cup of, of juice that will come down your row. And it's to remember the death and sacrifice of Jesus. And I, if, if you're not ready to take of that today or perhaps you're not a follower of Jesus, it is okay to let it pass. But I want us to use this time to remember that we've been called to holiness and to remember that we humbly come to the cross because without the sacrifice of Jesus, we have nothing. It was the blood of Jesus that made us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, a chosen, adopted people. Let's never forget that. If you would stand with me, we're going to sing at this time in Christ alone. Let's sing together.